All right, Genesis chapter 9. And just a final note, Joan and I were talking about these things uh, between the last class and this one. And we were discussing how um, a lot of time. Uh, well, I said to her, I said, how, how many people do you know, or something like this, I said, that when they picture themselves going to the throne of God to pray or to talk to the Lord, how many of them do you think see a rainbow there? And we concluded that probably none. <clears throat> and that would be one reason why maybe a lot of people would go to the throne, oh Lord, and they would, you know, oh Lord, I messed up, help me, I'm a bad person, I need your help. You understand what I'm saying? In this, this sort of a person being under judgment or fear of judgment. And instead of relating to your father, you relate to God as judge of the whole earth. And, you know, if you want to check that out, read 1 John, the first chapter, and you'll begin to see that it's now our Father who is the judge, and he's not judging us the way he did when we were sinners. It's a whole different relationship. We are his children now. <clears throat> so, um, so anyway, the, the thought comes when you know that that rainbow is there, you come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen? I mean, you ever wonder why it says, come boldly? Well, it's a great saying, you know, it's a good one to quote, but how many of us are bold to come to that throne because we know that that rainbow is there and we know he looks at it all the time and remembers. See, that's, that's the key. All right. Genesis um, chapter 9 and verse 20. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank the wine and became drunk, and he was uncovered within his tent. <coughs> and I'm going to assume that he was laying there naked, okay? <coughs> and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Verse 24, And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, <clears throat> and Canaan, shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. <clears throat> All right. So, you know, there's that statement, uh, Noah got drunk in the eyes of the Lord. <clears throat> and um, so there's, there's two sins mentioned here, okay? <clears throat> Very different. Noah is shamed as the first one who sinned in the cleansed in the new earth. But Ham glories in the failure and the fallen estate of someone else. Okay, So that's what we need to consider. We need to consider failing or falling into sin. We need to consider this other sin of... Um, glorying in somebody's fall. I think I wrote it a little differently here. He saw the nakedness and then told his brothers. He saw it and then he told. It is one thing to fall into a snare, but another to gloat and glory over the failures of another and to spread it around. Amen? Now we're going to see that God actually makes a distinction between these two and deals with them dif differently. Okay, <clears throat> But folks, if I could just talk from my heart for a minute, I am telling you, one of the biggest failures you can make is to see somebody, anybody, mess up and then go tell everybody. You can say, and here's, uh, here's probably the thing in the hand. Well, that's sin. That's wrong. You see? 
and that justifies us sinning and doing worse. That's what we'll see. Worse in the eyes of the Lord. In the eyes of the Lord. You know? <clears throat> I mean, they went, the, the other two brothers went to great lengths. Man, what kind of training did they have? I mean, think of that. When two out of three, that's some pretty good training. Praise God. You know, oh, that two out of three people in the church, two out of, you know, two-thirds of the church would go, no, you know, put something over their ears or hold a blanket up and cover it. You understand what I'm saying? But you don't see that. You see just the opposite. You see a minute amount of people that, why? Because we've raised sinning and getting drunk or doing something as the highest thing. Folks, that's doing something wrong, but the other one is a violation of God's nature. One is a violation of his law. Another one's a violation of his nature. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, so I'll read this again. It is one thing to fall into a snare, but another to gloat and glory over the failures of another and to spread it all around. But the other two would not look, but they covered some might accuse them of going backwards, and I, there's a rest of the sentence, but remember what they did? They held it, this, this garment up, and their father was in the tent, and they walked backwards and laid it over him so that they never saw it. And so somebody might come along and go, you guys are going backwards. Am I right or wrong? I mean, I've heard that said of people who, you know, we're operating in love. Love covers a multitude of sins. I mean, you know, I, I, this is my personal thing. I believe that the greatest lack among Christians, the greatest virtue and the greatest lack that is there is just love. Just Because when you love somebody, there's, that does a whole bunch of stuff. But when you love yourself, you will turn on them, you will expose them, and you'll do it You'll do it for your reasons. Well, I'm hurt. Well, I didn't like this. Well, I, you know, you understand what I'm saying? And we, you know, we, if God tells you to, to point out sin or something, he's not telling you to do it in the wrong spirit. Okay. Um, the, the thing I usually bring up is because I've been around in this thing for 35 years years or more, actually more, <clears throat> is uh, I found that the, now nowadays we have the internet, we have email and stuff like that, so things are changing, but the biggest gossip line there used to be, the biggest way to get gossip out was in prayer meeting. Yes, yes. Someone would say, well I want us to just pray about brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, they did this and that and this and that and da 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 you know, and they'd say, let's just pray for them. You know, it's kind of like being in a court of law, and then you say all this stuff, and the guy says, objection, wipe that from your mind. You know, and you go, okay. You know, kind of, you know. And then when you hear the prayer, it's, oh, Lord, help them, they're messed up. Instead of pleading with the Lord for them. And I'm just telling you, folks, you know, you know this, all the slogans and sayings. I mean, you know, the church is the only, only organization that kills its own wounded. You know, you get wounded, you get hurt, you get down and out, and people just come at you. And, you know, I mean, there's a multitude of things that says, you know, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. What's that talking about? Well, I'll tell you exactly what it is. For the love of God is seen. This is all in one, you know, we're not jumping too far. It's just a few verses right all together. For the love of God is seen in that he died for the ungodly. For yet for a righteous man would some dare to die, but he did. This is the love. <laughs> you know, it's that we, we go, oh, the love of God is that we hug when we see each other or that we da 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 no 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 that's first of all that that's probably the love of man the love of flesh the, the human love his love 
is that he dies not just for the ones, you know, I mean, the one that needs it. You know, the one that needs it. Anyway, I don't want to harp on that too much, but this, this is such an incredible story here. <clears throat> um, so let me finish this statement. Some might accuse them of going backward. Now, as if they have failed also. They, they're going backward, so they failed by covering, and that's the deal. Have you ever heard that? Well, you're covering up the issues. No, I'm covering my brother or sister, but in this case, brother, you know. <clears throat> um, I forget what the conversation was once, but, oh, I, I know. I was, I was talking to Ben about becoming a pastor and stuff, and I said, let me tell you something right up front. People are going to tell you stuff that they don't tell anybody else. And I said, the most important thing that you can do is not repeat it because if they hear it by, from somebody else and they know you're the only one they told, they will never trust you again. I said, you can be assured your ministry will be over with if you keep repeating stuff that someone told you in private. And I said, in 35 years, you would not imagine the stuff I've been told. And I said, I don't tell my wife. People assume, you know, I, people even say, well, I don't even care if you tell Debbie or not. I, I, don't, I don't tell her. She's not a pastor. She doesn't have the grace that's been given to me. You know what I mean? A lot of pastors fail their wives by telling them stuff when they are in, in dude with an office and all of the traits that go with that, but their wife isn't. That's just a wife, not a pastor. And it just messes with them just eats them up and stuff like that. I don't do that, you know. I don't do that. So anyway, it's, it's just this thing of, uh, of don't repeat stuff, you know. You go, your mind can even say, well, see, you know, now I know that, and then there's this pattern and this pattern. You know what, the only pattern, and this is the truth, and I don't let my mind go anywhere. I do not, and that's the truth. I don't. I, I keep my mind with the Lord. The worst problem I have is not with y'all, it's me. You know, I can have faith for you. I just have sometimes tro trouble having faith for me. Do anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like, man, I can stand for, through thick and thin for you, but <laughs> help, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you just keep your eyes on the throne and on the rainbow and realize that, that uh, God is bringing them through. And then when you understand these principles, I mean, if I saw this in my Bible and I didn't know anything else, I would say, well, Jesus, I'm just a new Christian. I love you, but I'm not going to talk to anybody else about anybody else's problems. I'm not going to bring up John. Now, that's me. All right, so... Their purpose was to restore such an one. Remember, it says that. <clears throat> and I thought it's funny because that scripture says, ye that are spiritual. Whoa, you mean it's spiritual to not look and then not, you know, spread it all around? <clears throat> Noah awakens from his failure and is restored. Am I right? There, there's proofs, I haven't said it yet, but there's proofs that he is. He's, he, he comes out of it. See, he, that's one good thing about some of that stuff. You can go through it and come out of it. But boy, you let a root of bitterness in you where you just talk about everybody in a critical spirit, that's the, that one's ugly. My God, it eats you alive. It's, it's, like a, it's like some sort of monster little creature that's eating your insides out and stuff. And of course, you're spewing poison about someone else but it's eating you up that's what i hate because it's like a self-destructive thing so noah awaken, awakens from his failure and is restored now noah is in a in a position to judge him who judged him to judge ham who judged noah it's right it's written right here uh, verse uh 
Well, 24 and 25, and Noah awoke from his wine and knew that his younger son had, uh, had done unto him what his younger son had done unto him, and he said, cursed be Canaan. Where's he getting that from? You know, here's the way most religious people are. He's, Noah starts talking, cursed be Canaan, and they stop him right there and say, cursed be Canaan, cursed be you. You sinned. Let me tell you something. David sinned. All these people sinned, but the Lord was with certain ones of those. The Lord was with them. You don't know. If the Lord's with somebody, man, you need to just, you know, and we should, again, love is not partial. But when I perceive that the Lord is with somebody, the fear of the Lord comes upon me because I know from the word of God and all the different situations, man, I just want to walk with the Lord. I don't want to be crossing any lines here. And that's the way I've tried to keep myself all these years. So Noah, um, he, all of a sudden, he, he's out. He's re out of that situation. The wine's gone. He's restored. And now he's prophesying. And by the way, it was from the Lord because it came true. Okay? So clearly he got restored. And clearly the Lord is saying, you know, your issue is not near as bad as this guy's. So um, he says, cursed be Canaan. What was wrong with Ham, <clears throat> well, I wrote it like this. What, what was wrong with Ham more than Noah? There was a rainbow but Ham rejects the rainbow. It really is the issue, folks. It really is. That rainbow said no more curse, no more judgment. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and see from there. Receive the, 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 the heavenly light in all of its aspects, not the earthly circumstances and all of its gory details you know ham rejects the rainbow and that's a, that's a bigger deal to god than starting your own garden and getting drunk off the wine of it <clears throat> um and let's just just to, you know just to throw this in just to make sure I mean, my both my parents were alcoholics my life was miserable. My brothers and sisters was. It was horrible. I hate the smell of alcohol on somebody's breath that's drunk. I hate how they cry and apologize. I, hate, I could go on and on and on and on and on. So for me to not jump on Noah <laughs> is the Lord. My whole life could be ruined because of the Noah's. But because of the Lord and the rainbow, I was lifted out of all of what that I went through as a kid, taken completely out of it, no longer of that. And so I just want to make sure that you understand, I'm not, you know, it's not like, well, he's justifying this or that. <laughs> no, I'm not. I know how tough that is. But I believe these issues right here, that God looks at one way worse than the other one. <clears throat> so... Um, what was wrong with Ham more than Noah? There was a rainbow, but Ham rejects the rainbow. This was the first test. Now there is punishment and judgment, not for sin, but for rejecting grace and taking sides with the accuser, God's greatest enemy. Yeah. Um, It's as if for Ham there is no rainbow. Because he didn't find it. Right. And so it's as long as he's rejecting it, guess what, man? You're 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 putting yourself in a position of judgment. And Jesus said that, you know. Uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Um, you know. To what degree you judge someone else, you shall be judged also. You know, so you're you're judging that there is no rainbow for him. Guess what? Get ready. The Lord's gonna come in the clouds, but there ain't gonna be no rainbow. You know, it'd be the God of judgment instead of 
him who is the rainbow coming in the clouds. And then just this thought, you know, I mean, rejecting grace is one thing. Taking sides with the accuser of the brethren, you know, that's just not good. That's the greatest enemy God has. And you're going, you know, I'll listen to his whispers, you know. I mean, it's always that, it's that, that picture. What does the devil look like? Well, he's red with horns and a tail, long tail and a pitchfork. So that when we're walking around, we go, oh, there's the devil. I see him over there. But no, he comes as an angel of light. He can walk up in somebody that's nice and sweet and says, oh, you know, I just think we need to be praying for sister so-and-so. This and this happened. Really? You know, yeah, and this and this and this. And you don't know how much tearing down you can do that God, you know, I mean, look at, Look at Noah, look at David, look at all these people. They ended up still going on with the Lord and being, you know, yeah, Moses on and all. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Don't reject the rainbow for others and you'll have it for you. But I mean, it really was as if he did. Um, so uh, the one who survived the flood, the wilderness part, this is Noah I'm talking about, prophesies the downfall of Canaan to the brothers who enter into Canaan. Ham is Canaan, by the way. Shem is who? The Jews. He's prophesying the future. He's prophesying the present. It's all one and the same to the Lord. He's not caught up in time. He says, Ham, you're this way. You are Canaan. Out of you will come Canaan. Well, how did Noah know what he was going to name his kid and what the land would be named? Well, he's just in tune with the Lord. That's all you can say. And uh, so let me read that again. The one who survived the flood, meaning he survived the wilderness and came into the land. The one who survived the flood prophesies the downfall of Canaan to the brothers who enter in. A flood, a new flood of the people of God will pour in and destroy the old creation of Canaan. That's what happened when they left Egypt and came through the wilderness. They came into the land of Canaan and the inhabitants of Ham held that land and God said, go in there and kill every one of them. And a flood's come, you know, here's the, here's the story that, that um, Rahab in Jericho, one of the Canaanites is getting. She told the spies, we have heard of your fear and dread. We know that you're gonna take this land. We know that you know, you're, we're all gonna be overthrown and everything like that. I mean, the prophecy went down and down and down for generations. We know that you're gonna end up overrunning us. And so here comes the judgment again, a flood, a flood of God's people. taking away in its sweeping movement all the inhabitants of Canaan and filling it with Shem. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, and it's that, that is the line of Christ. That's right. That's the line of the seed. So you understand it is the seed that we're talking about always and forever, and yet... <clears throat> If we just think this is about doing right or wrong or how good that person's doing and I'm doing better than them and this and that, we're deceived and we're going to get off eventually. We will. This is about the seed and God prophesies about the seed and what the seed will do. Ham, you're, you're another seed. You're not the right seed. Your spirit shows it. Your actions show it. And the judgment will come on you. And it'll come on all of the seed until you're wiped out. You know, and by the way, a whole lot of people, you know, today, they, they say, well, there should be a Palestinian state, you know, in, in Israel or Canaan. <clears throat> well, we should let the Palestinians have a state. Folks, there are no actual Palestinians anymore. There are no Hittites. There aren't. There are no descendants of Philistines. There aren't. You can't find them. 
most of the people that are in the land of Israel, Canaan, are either Arabs or Jews. They're not, you know, a Palestinian home state for Arabs. I'm just telling you the truth. But they want to say, well, we're Palestinian, you know, and we're the PLO, you know, and we're the Palestine Liberation Organization. Boy, you may be liberating the country of Palestine, if that's what you want to call it, but you, you're a descendant of Esau. You know, so just, you know, so you know. And that's why they kick and fight so much. Let me tell you, if this prophecy is true, they couldn't even put up as much fight as they do. Right? If, if this prophecy is true, they couldn't do. But it's not to them. They're, they're Arabs. They're Esau or Ishmael. <coughs> All right. I got off of that one. I'm ready for a drink. <laughs> yes. Yeah, see, my problem is I've been at this so long, it's the brethren I'm worried about. You know what I mean? I mean, I've, <laughs> I don't have, you know, it's kind of like Jesus. He got along with the sinners real well. <laughs> it's, it's the religious people that, that hung him on a cross. <clears throat> yeah, and that were filled with Satan. Okay, so uh, moving right along. <clears throat> So a, a flood, a new flood of people, of the people of God would pour in and destroy the old creation of Canaan. Ham accused Noah. Canaan accused Israel. They would lose their land to the Hebrews, to Seth. I mean Shem, sorry. Um, the, the home of the accusers would become the sanctuary and place of rest for the accused. Pretty cool. <laughs> but not enslaved, but killed. God didn't say enslaved. History and the way it fell did not just happen. The seeds of it were put in the ground a long time ago, back at Noah's time. Isn't that an amazing thing? I mean, Hundreds of years later, and and here, and just give you a little another hint here. The truth is the truth is the truth. There is not eight million truths about stuff. There is a basic pattern that God is and God walks in. God is as God does. Just like. Stupid is a stupid does, but that's <clears throat> he. Is, and so the doing of it, the key to knowing the doing is to know the being of it. <clears throat> and the way that he works is by seed. And the way that he works is if it's this way in this situation, it'll be that way in every situation. Meaning, if Ham's doing this, and Ham really is not of the right seed, and and uh, Shem is, then. It's real easy to prophesy. Here's what's going to happen to Shem, and here's what's going to happen to Ham. We say a bunch of generations have passed. He's the seed of that. Now, <clears throat> my family was a mess. My parents were alcoholics. They fought, and they beat each other up, and then they beat us, or my dad, stepfather particularly, but my dad did the same thing, beat us up and beat my mom up, you know? I'd go, I got beat up trying to protect my mom and stuff. Horrible nights and horrible experiences and stuff. And, and I remember when I had three little kids, and I, I mean, I just went, oh, God, I don't want this stuff to pass down. And I, I just said, you know, 
I would like, and, and, you know, I mean, my brother just passed away. He'd, he'd been married four times, and my mom was married, you know, three, I think, and, you know, on and on and on throughout my family and all this stuff. And I just said, God, I just, I want something different for my family. Please, not, not a repeat of me, which is them. You understand? Being of that seed. And then the wonderful truth began to come about being one with Jesus and about being of that seed, which seed is Christ, the only hope for breaking my DNA, the only hope of not ending up exactly the way my family did, the only hope. Let me tell you, I grabbed it. I didn't just say, oh, that's a wonderful religious truth. Love to hear that in sermons. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Jesus. You know? No, I went, oh, my God, this is it. This is my way out. This is the key. This will work. I, this can, now, that can work for someone like me. And, man, I went after it with all my heart, with all my heart. <clears throat> and as it were, didn't have a father, so my heavenly father really, really did become my father, and I mean really. I don't mean, you know, in a spiritual sort of way. I mean the only one I get wisdom from, the only one I can look to, the only one. And he'd already given me years before I even started having kids of what he was like to me as a father. I messed up, and he'd show mercy. I'd, you know... Uh, I, I remember one time, some of you may remember back to the great rock band. Some of you remember that? And, and uh, I, I forget what it was, but I would messed up somehow and felt really bad before the Lord and, and everything. And, uh, and we, were, we were playing somewhere. I think it was, oh, it was down in Deep Ellum for sure. We were playing down in Deep Ellum. And I just was like, oh, God, you know, I don't want to do this. I feel so bad. I failed you. I, you know, anybody go through stuff like that? No rainbow. <clears throat> and this guy comes walking up, and I was playing this cheap old, what we call Jesus is Lord Hondo. It was a Hondo brand, which is, you almost can't get any cheaper. And that was the guitar I was playing, because that's the one the Lord gave me. And this guy walks up and gives me a brand new Fender Telecaster. And says, here, I said, what? Oh, can I play that tonight? And he said, no, I'm giving it to you. <laughs> Lord, don't do this. <laughs> I mean, I, I was just like, oh, no, what are you doing? Hit me. Don't be nice to me. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, you know, I'd rather be slapped around, which is what I grew up with. You know what I mean? Bah, bah, and then you, then you go, okay, <laughs> then, it's all better now. I took the, you know, but he's being nice to you, and you're just going, I don't deserve this. I, this is worse than hitting me. <laughs> and it, that's, honestly, I remember it clearly. It felt worse. It was just like, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> you know, it's just, this isn't very nice almost, you know, because it's so nice. <clears throat> and it registered something in me. It registered something in me about my father. Experiences over and over and over and over and over and over until I realized when I'm a father, I have to be like my father. Now, I know, you know, I've got at least one daughter in here who will say, you're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you are a terrible dad. <laughs> I'm, that's why I sent the other one away. But with all my being, I tried to focus in on this thing of allowing, and not just being like him, allowing the father to be the one who fathered through me. Man, I mean, stuff that I could never do in myself and, and actions that I know because the, the old seed wanted to rise, you know? And then the, the father would come through and I'd just go, oh my God. God, this works. This really works. There's real hope, but you can't fake it, and you can't say, okay, I'm going to be like the Father. I mean, for me, it was like, this is my only hope. 
or I'm going to continue the line of Canaan. I'm going to to continue the line of Ham. And everything in me said, no more. And when I had three girls, I said, praise God. And I did. I said, with all my heart, praise God. No more Nussbaum. (laughs) No more. It's the end of the line, baby. (laughs) You know? Honestly, it just felt so good. And it was like an answer to prayer from the Lord. I will end your line. I will give you three girls. Well, good. You know, before that time, in my BC days, oh, baby, don't have a boy continue to name this ball. Got to be like me. We got to keep up the, you know, dude. And after I came to the Lord and saw what I was, and not just what I was, but what Ham was, I said, you know, we're all of the same thing. There's got to be a change. Anyway, I'm sorry I'm going on. But I will tell you, these are, these are things that are the biggest things to me because they're not teaching. I, I mean, I may teach them, and to you they may be teaching. To me, this was like being shut up in a dark cave and there's doors in that cave and they're all shut except for one way over there and it was this door of faith to come out of the ark and into the new creation it was this it was this promise it gave me the sense of hope and it gave me the sense of the clarity of the of how i saw it was this could work and I know I say that all the time but I'm telling you for me I was going because you don't know what it's like when you go nothing works nothing will work I messed up I'm you know I've got too much DNA in me you know and you just you just freaked out because you know like I said uh, there there is light at the end of the tunnel but it's a freight train <laughs> you know and you're just going ah. Oh, God, you know, that there is just, you know, and you, you really, honestly, you bang on the door, you know, beating on this one, and it's just locked and shut to you. Beating on this one, and you're going, I'm running out of options here. And then he says, here's your way out. I am the way. And I went, oh, God, I can do this. Because it's not doing anything, it's being one. And letting him do it. And I know that's teaching. The teaching of it doesn't do it. Getting in that ark and being shut in with those beasts for an amount of time that you are ready to get out and be with the Lord. You say, well, you know, I mean, over the years I've been with a lot of people who've gone through stuff. And I remember one guy came to me and said, well, I'm like the prodigal son. And he said, but now I've come to an end of myself. Two days later, he's back. You know, doing that. Six months later, he comes back to the church. Oh, God, I've hit rock bottom. This is it. Two days later, a week later, he's back at this junk again. Uh, end of the year, comes back. This is it. Ground zero. <laughs> hit rock bottom. I said, look, I, I want to believe you, but I think you got a lot of false bottoms in your barrel. <laughs> you know? Because they keep dropping lower and lower and lower. And you keep saying, oh, this is it. And I saw what he was doing. He's going, this is it, rock bottom. And I know once you hit rock bottom, then the Lord, you know, then the revel, then all this, you know. So I'm at the end. You think God's going to go, I guess he is. He sounds sincere. <laughs> you know, I mean, God knows. He goes, he ain't even close to the end. Even trying to pull this trick shows that there's a lot of you left. You know? That's just a a good thing to know. You can't fool God. It's a good thing to know. You can't fool God. We're so used to fooling everybody else, and eventually we start fooling ourselves. You know, we're all idiots. I mean, in in that frame, we are. And then we then we start do, thinking, you know, yeah, now God's in with us. We're all this and everything's, you know. And He's going, people, people, 
you know, because the Lord knows where we're at, and if he says you haven't hit rock bottom yet, then what do you do? You fasten your seatbelt and you say, Lord, I'm with you no matter how hard it gets. I'm still with you. We have our limits, but Lord, you are going to give me grace because you know what? There's two, it's real simple. There's two things to live by, either grace or Christ. And until Christ is fully formed in you, you're going to need grace. In areas that Christ is formed, in certain areas of your life, you don't need grace. Christ is living there. There is no failure. But in areas where you don't have Christ formed, you need grace. Oh, no, not us. We're the deeper life people. We know all the good stuff. You know, grace. We don't talk about needing grace anymore. We just talk about, my God. What is, this, what is the phrase there? But for the grace of God. <coughs> all right. I need to move on here. Uh, Ham accused Noah. Canaan accused Israel. They would lose their land to the Hebrews. The home of the accusers would become the sanctuary and place of rest for the accused. Um, prophecy equals not just future events, but declaring what a seed will eventually bring forth. Did you hear that? That's, what, that's a definition of prophecy. My definition. Prophecy is not just future events, but declaring what a seed, a seed will eventually bring forth. I learned that years and years ago. I went through this thing. It was an imaginary situation in my mind where I had an apple seed in my hand. And I said, in my mind, I prophesy branches and eventually green leaves and, bi and red apples coming off. I prophesy it. Yay, it will take many years. But I prophesy it. Put it in the ground, here it comes. It's just like what he said. My God, what a man of God. Okay, take rice. I prophesy rice. I prophesy it'll be a certain shape in a certain way. Put it in there. There you go. A whole, uh, uh, you know, wheat. I prophesy wheat. People start going, my God, you're good at this. And then I began to realize as I searched the scriptures, I began to find out that many of these guys weren't prophesying like God's got their ear, you know, and he's going, look, here's what's going to happen. It's future and nobody's going to get this but you because, you know, uh, but my foreknowledge is going to explain everything. You know, and I don't think that's the case. I think, I, and I've seen it already, in many cases, there is an understanding of the seed and what it's going to do. You know, it's like a, what is that, a horse apple? Anybody familiar with horse apples? I prophesy mush and worms. Those of you, yeah, see, the few that really know horse apples, I watched their face when I said that, and they went, oh, baby, you are right there. That's what they, that's what ends up happening. Okay, we'll take that spiritually. Take it spiritually. And if someone is of a horse apple seed, you can say it's going to, there's going to have worms. They're going to be infested, and they're going to have mushy lives and stuff like that. That's not... That's not deep prophecy. That is a recognition of what the seed is all about. <laughs> all right. Hush up back there. <clears throat> all right. Prophecy equals not just future events, but declaring what a seed will eventually bring forth. The actions of Ham and the actions of of Shem and Japheth, you could just call it seeds or early prophecy. Amen? Early, it's the beginning of a line of prophecy along this line. 
uh, I wrote, Noah looked at the seed and predicted its maturity and its fruit. Predicted, exactly. And just along that line, that truth, and I'm sure we still have the class and probably all of you take it, it's called the Law of Seed Time and Harvest. Do y'all, have y'all had it yet? Okay, well in that class I just go over the, this reality of what I called, I think in that class, predicting the future. You, does that even sound familiar? Maybe I didn't say it that way in that class. But I remember when the Lord showed me that and he said, you know, it's like, I've got this field over here that's blank, and I've got this field over here that's blank, and I've got this field over here, and I can predict my future. I'm going to plant oranges over here, and I'm going to plant lettuce over here, and I'm going to plant something else over here, and I'm, I'm, you know, now the seeds are in the ground, and I'm going to be faithful to water it, washing of the water of the word, but I predict my future. And I tell you what, it's so easy to predict some of these people's future who don't understand that principle. And they're just running off of random thoughts and they think they've got pr- Christian principles, but what they've got is the law in some form. And it's not seed principle. It's just, you know, and I, I even hesitate to say Christian, religious Uh, codes that they have adhered to. Folks, before there was a world, before there was a religion, before there was a man, there was God, and he wasn't religious. We say, well, he must have been because he started a Jewish religion, then he started a Christian religion, he started all that. He didn't start a Jewish religion, he didn't start a Christian religion. He raised up the Jewish people and meant for them in every way, shape, and form to be a type and shadow of a deeper truth, a greater truth that would be revealed. Christians were supposed to come along and not try to copy the Jews, but I'm going to say it like this, not try to copy the Jews, but copy Jesus. Now, we don't copy Jesus. We become one with him and da-da-da. But I'm just trying to say, um, you know, nowadays people are trying, it's incredible. They're literally going back to the Jewish thing, which was all shadows, you know, and building their whole churches off of, you know, well, uh, you know, I saw a guy on, I saw a guy on TV the other night, and he was a Christian preacher, and he was dressed, and his beard and everything was like a Hasidic Jew, which, by the way, Hasidic Jews didn't show up until way after Jesus had come and, you know, gone, you know, but I mean, it's, okay, so, you know, the only way to really understand the Bible is to understand the Jews. To me, if you want to understand somebody's book, ask the author. I don't think God was Jewish. I'm just thinking. And I don't think he was Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal or anything else. I don't think he joined any of those. You know, when I got saved, man, I I was challenged by the Lord really dealing with me to read the Bible so I could prove that it contradicts itself. So I started reading the Bible and in my own bed met Jesus. And I'll never forget when I met him, he said, I'm Methodist. <laughs> you know, go find the tallest steeple. You know, I mean, I, I, now I know I was a hippie. I was anti, you know, everything and all that kind of stuff. But I remember meeting Jesus and he wasn't pointing. He didn't say, look, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to send you to my denomination. He said, follow me. He didn't come to start a religion. He came to get a bride. The father came to get sons in the image of Christ. Or the father initiated the plan to get sons. Jesus came 
to get a bride. And so, let me make sure I'm, I'm getting the hand signals back there again. And then this is just rough notes, but I'll, I'll try to finish with this right here. Soon after this is when the Tower of Babel thing happened. And uh, this tower was raised up, and God's response to it was another curse. Because they rejected the rainbow. They rejected the heavenly light. They rejected the judgment that already was, just like Ham. Ham's trying to bring another judgment back here, and God's saying, I've settled the judgment. Does that make sense? I mean, folks, that's a total rejection of the work of God, of what God had in mind, and it's just judging people because we don't like them or something, you know? So soon this tower was raised up, and God's response was a curse. What is a tower? Man on earth improving toward God, but not lifting up and seeing what is already above. Did, do I need to read that again? Say it again. The tower, the Tower of Babel, <clears throat> is man on earth improving towards God, meaning building, trying to get higher and higher, but not lifting up and seeing what is already above, the rainbow. I just described a huge portion of Christianity. trying to get better, trying to improve ourselves, trying to stop this and stop that and stop, you know. It's usually about stopping something. I mean, many Christians, if you ask them how do you please God, they will tell you the things they don't do. That's how they please God. But I'm telling you that it's not based on what you don't do in that sense. And so, let's see, the tower again rejects grace. And it rejects the work of the ark to get you to the new creation. It says, I'm separated from God. God's way up there, but I'm working hard at it, and I'm building, and I'm getting closer every day. Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Anyway. <clears throat> the pause for those that are listening to this was shock and awe as I looked into the face of the people. <clears throat> the tower again rejects grace just like Ham. Soon after Babel and Nimrod, comes another who seeks God. His name is Abram. He's the beginning of the fulfillment of Noah's prophecy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your words and your heart and your communications and your desire to reach us through this Noah class. And Lord, you've spoken to us so many things, more than maybe we can shove in our head, that you're faithful. And may each part of this not fall to the ground and be lost, but become a seed become a seed that is in us, even though right now, just like a seed underground, we don't see it growing. We don't see the effect. We're not sure if anything's happening. But let the seeds of this spring up in us eventually and bring forth your son. And may you be honored by it and may we be blessed by the oneness of it. Father, we are just miserable when we're not looking at the rainbow, when we're not letting the Holy Spirit reveal what you're really like. That man on the throne in Ezekiel was like a rainbow. Lord, 
may we be given grace until it is Christ. We ask for grace. And Lord David said, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Lord, if it was just the law, we wouldn't need our eyes open. We'd just see it. But it's you that he wanted to see. And he wanted to be changed. And that's your heart. And you will never give up on that plan. And as long as we stick with you with, in your plan, you will bring it to pass. So I ask for strength to bring forth. Strength to have this baby. That Christ will come forth. I ask you to give, if necessary, the gifts by grace. strength and power and all the things that we would need to continue and to go through this present time until the day dawn and the day star rises in our heart. You are faithful. You will not give up on your plan and we will not give up on being with you in that plan. Faithful are you who called us, who also will do it. And everybody said, Amen.